Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Grace Bible Church of Phoenix. We're uh, so happy to have you here this morning. Um, today we're celebrating Father's Day. If you're like me and haven't told your dad Happy Father's Day yet, why don't you take this moment to do that now? Happy Father's Day, Pops. <laughs> Talk is cheap. Where's my present? <laughs> That's what I want. I'm going to buy it at the store later. Um, <laughs> If you could stay with us, we're going to start our worship service this morning with singing. And uh, today we're going to focus on um, worshiping our perfect father here on Father's Day. We're going to be singing some songs uh, about some of my favorite characteristics of, of God as our father this morning. So uh, we're going to start with singing a song called Trust in God. Never 
Father, we thank you for this time where we can come together, Lord, and we can worship you in song, praise you for the loving Father that you are, Lord. We thank you for the example that you set for us, Lord, and we pray that you will uh, open our hearts and our minds to what you have to teach to us in your word today. Be with us, and as we leave this place, keep us safe. And we pray. Amen.
Oh 
Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day. This is a day that we remind ourselves that there are so many father figures in our lives, and it's good to be able to celebrate and encourage one another in our walk with each other as we are, I guess, as you men are leading your families as well as those nearby. Even if you do not have kids, this is still a day that we thank you for the way that you have poured into the lives of those that are near you because we need that. And we're also so thankful that we get to sing of the love of our Father as he loves us so incredibly much that he has given us his son so that we can have life with him. I just want to say welcome. We're glad that you're visiting. If you're here with us for the first time, we do want to connect with you a few different ways. There's always the way of scanning the QR code going online or via the app just to connect with us with the connection card. It gives us a little information about what you're interested in as well as how we can talk. Um, but that's just one of the ways that we would love to connect with you. Uh, but this week, I want to kind of, it's not just look forward, but also look back. So I'm going to invite Elizabeth to come forward, because if you notice, the stage is a little different than what we had last Sunday. So we've been able to have our VBS week, and so we're encouraged to hear some of the different things that have gone on. Elizabeth, if you want to share. So yes, this past week we had Vacation Bible School, where we welcomed an average of 50 to 55 kids every night. Um, it was a great time. We had over 40 leaders help out, so that was awesome. Um, we had, our theme was the Great Jungle Journey, as you can see, where we had an epic cruise from Genesis to Revelation, which seems like a lot to cover in a week, which <laughs> it kind of was. Um, but we covered the seven seas of history. So we talked about creation, how God created the earth, and it was perfect. Um, but then corruption came into the world with sin and Adam and Eve. Um, and then catastrophe with the flood and Noah. And then we talked about confusion with the Tower of Babel. And then we got to talk about Christ and the cross and how God sent him to the world to redeem everything and to save us. Um, and then the last day we talked about consummation and the completion of the story in the future that God will make all things good again. Um, so it was a lot, but it was fun. Um, I think the kids learned a lot. We had one kid that we know of that accepted Christ. So that was awesome. And we are hoping and praying that there are more. And even if it's just a seed planted where maybe they learned about Christ for the first time. So, um, so I just want to thank you, all the leaders that were here. Thank you so much for your help and your dedication. And anyone that prayed for us, um, we appreciate that. So we are going to show a slideshow of uh, the last day along with <coughs> the theme song. So you might hear some of the kids sing along with it. <laughs> Let's go to the jungle and this is a plan. Discovering secrets made by the great I am. Journey from Genesis to Revelation to know where you're going. To know where you're going and learn what we began. Let's go!
Corruption, catastrophe, confusion. Christ, the cross, then consummation. And Jesus raised for eternity. Yeah. Hey, hey, hey. Can you hear our jungle jam? Hey, hey, hey. It began with the great I am. Hey, hey, hey. Can you hear our jungle jam? Hey, hey, hey. It began with the great I am. Yeah, you can tell we did have a lot of fun throughout the week. It was kind of fun even just watching some of those that were here. It's really hard for us to not actually do some of the motions of the song, and I did love seeing some of those motions as they're in this row. Yeah, a lot of fun throughout the whole entire week. Thank you so much, all of those that volunteered were part of this. It is an encouraging week. We have one other thing that is coming up that we want you guys to be aware of. It is West Coast Grace Youth Camp. It is coming July 14th through the 20th out at Mount Palomar. Um, you can find all of the cost as well as how to sign up at wcgyc.com. Uh, this is a really big time for a lot of the different age groups. We have one week, but we have all different age groups. So if you're going in through... I, I believe it's into third grade all the way up. There even is, uh, well, I think some opportunities for college students if you're interested. Uh, talk with Mike McFadden. He is in the back in the booth. Obviously, you may know him. But talk with him. You can also go online to sign up. As you can see, you can actually, uh, if you're interested in helping out in some way or another, and if you're able to be at camp, talk to him about some of the volunteering opportunities. But we want to encourage you. Uh, these are some of the pictures from camps, whether it comes from games, as you can tell this is the craziness of games all the way just to some of the bible lessons this is a good time for you to be encouraged and walk with god as well as sharing the gospel with others so we want to put that on your radar the 14th through the 20th talk to mike if you have any questions right now though we're going to turn to uh, give this morning's offering uh, this is an act of worship so if this uh, this is a reminder that we're doing this not of compulsion but of something that we respond to the gifts that god has given us there are different ways to give the offering box in the back obviously you can go online you can even use our app there's our opportunities for you to provide um, the resources and it's what we use for our church to exist so let's pray as this also is the act of worship so Heavenly father we thank you so much for today that we can um, gather and that we can uh, pro proclaim your love we we are so thankful that you love us so much as our heavenly father uh, we just want to respond out of thanksgiving and and just praise we have opportunities to use our gifts and we've been able to see that with vbs and as we even look forward to uh, camp that there are ways for us to serve you but we also know that there's ways for us to express our gratitude by the gifts that we give um, to you and i pray that as we do that you would be uh, blessing um, these gifts, that we would be using these items for your glory um, with the different activities that we do, but we just pray that you would be with us in that. We also pray that you'd be with Pastor Joss as he presents this message this morning, and uh, I pray that it would not only be convicting to our hearts, but also something that would prompt us to live more in line with how you uh, desire us to be. Um, pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, kids, up through second grade, you are dismissed for Children's Church. As we were showing the video, I saw Pastor Brent bobbing his head up and down, and I was thinking, oh, okay, he's, he's going to start doing the motions. I was kind of disappointed. I thought you were going to do that. But... <clears throat> well, before we get into the message for today, I, I, we have a bonus announcement. Yay! I know you like bonus announcements. Uh, we have, just want to bring awareness to something. We have a, what's called a benevolent fund here at the church, and this is a fund that we use to help support people in our church family that are experiencing either emergency or very urgent financial situations. And situations that come up would be like um, an appliance in the house or, the, or your vehicle breaks and there's no funds to repair them or there's a sudden job loss and house bills need to be paid. So that's where we as a church come around people in those kinds of situations. And, and thankfully we have money to do that. <clears throat> that's what the Benevolent Fund is for. 
Um, recently, we've been using that money, which is great that we had it, but when you move, use money in a fund, it goes down. So I'm just bringing this to your awareness. If any of you would like to give to the church so that we can help our church family in these situations, uh, give to the Benevolent Fund. Um, it's very easy to do that. You can give through the app. There's actually a, de- a place where you can designate giving to the Benevolent Fund, or if you have a check, you can write in the memo for the Benevolent Fund. But anyway, this is just an announcement just to bring your awareness. Thank you for those who have supplied money for the Benevolent Fund. And I know that the people who receive help from there appreciate that as well. All right, well, let's get into the message for today. And for those of you who were here last week, you know uh, what we're going to be talking about today. And good job showing up anyway. Um, Before we begin, I want to say a couple things. Um, I know some of you are a little bit nervous about this message, um, especially with younger kids. We have kids that are lots of different ages here in in the sanctuary. So I'm just letting you know up front, I'm taking that into consideration. The, the sermon will be PG, PG-13, maybe at, at, at a couple of moments. Um, we're not going to go into any n- unnecessary details as we're on this subject. But we, we do need to talk about certain things that we need to talk about. And um, I think it's best for kids, they're going to hear this kind of talk out there in the world, on the playground, so it's good for them to hear this kind of subject discussed in church from God's perspective, okay? And the second thing is, and some of you might be concerned, um, maybe even convicted, and as as we get into this, this is something you're struggling with. And I want you to know, even before we open up the first passage of Scripture, that the goal of this sermon is the goal of God's will for our life, which is sanctification. God wants us to be holy, And for anyone who is struggling with this topic, remember, there is always forgiveness. This is one of all the different sins where there is forgiveness. And the Bible's message to us is one of restoration, it's one of hope, and it's one of freedom. So before we really get into our passage, uh, I just want to take just a moment and, and pray again. So pray with me. Dear Lord, we know that you are a God of both truth and grace. And somehow, miraculously, um, Jesus was able to live both of those perfectly. And we, and we don't. We, we just do not do that. But today, um, we desire to be exposed to both truth and to grace. And so help us to receive this passage as your, your words and your will for our life. And help us to discern the difference between what the world is teaching us and influencing us and what your word teaches us. Because in your word, that's where we find forgiveness, we find strength, we find healing, we find truth, hope, and we find our purpose in life. And so be with us, and may this message be honoring and glorifying to you. We pray this in Christ's name, amen. All right, well, this is a continuation in chapter four, which is about God's will. And so last week, we looked at what God's will is, and the guy's still there, he's still wondering what God's will is. Um, maybe he'll find it. But God's will, as we talked about last week, is for us to conform to God's plan. And Ephesians tells us what God's plan is, that in the fullness of times, everything in heaven and on earth will be united under Christ. That's God's plan. And God's will is that we conform to that as we live our life. And so God's will for us in this life is that we will be led by the Holy Spirit and we will live out our new identity as redeemed, forgiven people. We have been bought at a price. We are now Christ. That's God's will for our life. And so last week, we talked specifically about what sanctification is. And maybe a really quick, easy way to just define what sanctification is, it's the process of growing into the image of Christ. It's us being transformed into the image of Christ. And the emphasis here is on, it's a process, okay? It's a process. Sometimes we make progress with this, And sometimes we don't, because we're living in the flesh. And that's the purpose of today's message. And so in today's passage, Paul is addressing the Thessalonians. And one way that they were living outside of God's will for them was through their involvement in sexual immorality. So let's go ahead and we'll read our passage for today. This is chapter 4, verses 3 through 8. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, 
not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress or wrong his brother in this matter because the Lord is an avenger in all these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. <clears throat> so let's talk about what's happening in Thessalonica. Ironically, we look at our culture today and we think that it's pretty bad. Theirs was worse. I mean, there's no question about it. Theirs is worse. Here today in Western civilization, we have the benefit of having centuries of influence of the word of God and the Holy Spirit living in God's people. Western society has been greatly influenced by Bible-believing believers. They in Thessalonica and in Corinth, we're going to really talk about both of those, they, they had none of that. The influence of the Holy Spirit and God's word was just beginning. In fact, they lived with the idea, I'm going to share a couple of things, they lived with the idea that the body and the spirit are two different things. And if your body wants something, just do it. Just give the body what it wants. Just do it. They also lived with um, the influence of worshiping idols and pagan gods. And we brought this up in the introduction to 1 Thessalonians. I'll bring this up again. This happened in the city of Corinth, and I'm sure something similar was happening in Thessalonica. But in the city of Corinth, where Paul writes the book of Thessalonians, they worshiped the goddess Aphrodite. And that's the goddess of love and beauty. So you can tell that there's going to be some problems with that, with people living in the flesh. And the temple of Aphrodite was known to have 1,000 temple prostitutes. And they lived with this idea that in order to connect or to commune with the goddess Aphrodite, you would have sexual relationships with those prostitutes that brought you close to the goddess of Aphrodite. So for them, this was just what they did. This is just how they lived. And I can imagine a situation like this happening, and it would be very normal and accepted. And, and I'm not trying to make light of this, but maybe a situation like this happened where husband and wife were there, and the husband says, hey, honey, it's been a while since I've worshipped at the temple. I'm going to go worship, and I'll be home. Okay, honey, have a great day. Um, I'll see you when you come home. Dinner will be ready. Something like that. Now, maybe it wasn't like that. Maybe it was, but it's just what they did. That's just what their culture accepted and practiced. And they didn't see anything wrong with these things. Well, what about today? Phoenix, Arizona, Western culture, 2024. Again, fortunately for us today, we've had centuries of Christian influence that has impacted the way that we view sexual practice. In fact, our, our nation was founded on biblical principles. But right now, we see this. This is, this is changing, and it's changing quickly before our eyes. But our culture, we still have laws that prohibit certain types of sexual activity because it's obvious at how harmful and damaging it is on people in society. For instance, is prostitution being one of them. But today, this is what we're fighting. These are the thoughts and ideas that we're fighting. This is the influence of Satan on our culture. So let me share with you about two or three different thoughts that are being forced upon us. The first thought is this, that people are basically good and all but the most heinous of sexual activities should be tolerated and even more than tolerated, they should be celebrated. Okay? This is a thought that is being, we are being inundated with. Another thought is this. Sexual activity is simply a biological function and it's one way for a person to gain personal gratif gratif gratification. And so the thought is, as long as everyone is consenting, everyone should be able to do what they want to do because it's bringing them pleasure. That is a thought that is being imposed on us. Another thought, and this is uh, especially lately with the pride movement. Again, I didn't plan this, but it's, it's, I think it's very fitting that we're on this passage in the month of June. But with the pride movement, it's this idea that our sexual desires and activities are not just something that we do. It's, it's who we are. The pride movement is telling us we are that is our entire identity, is our sexual activities. And so we're taught, don't be ashamed of them. In fact, be filled with pride to identify your entire being around your sexual cravings. So that's what the world is teaching us. And we open God's word and we realize none of that is true. None of that is based on truth. That is not God's plan. In fact, all of that 
is outside of God's plan. And anything that's outside of God's plan is sin, and it's not the will of God. So before we get into the body of the message, let's just define this very clearly and basically and simply. What is sexual immorality according to the word of God, okay? Sexual immorality is any sexual activity in thought or action which is outside of God's plan, okay? So what is God's plan? Here it is. God designed sexual activity to take place this way. Sexual activity by God's design is to be practiced and enjoyed between one man and one woman in a committed monogamous marriage. That's God's plan and design for sexual activity and practice. And anything outside of that is sexual immorality. Well, let's read about God's plan, Genesis 2. This is why God created us, and this is how we are to live according to his plan. Genesis 2.18, it says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man that the man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. And all the men here said, Amen. (laughs) Verse 22. And the rib that was taken, that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Because she is taken out of man. Therefore, what, what, therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Right there, that's God's plan, that's God's design for sexual activity. One man, one woman, cleaving together in the bond of, of holy matrimony. That's God's plan. The New Testament confirms that anything outside of this is sexual immorality. We read about this from Hebrews 13.4. It says, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral or adulterous. So anything that's outside of one man, one woman, in the context of marriage, everything outside of that is sexual immorality. And God created us, as we know, male and female, and he put the sex drive within us so that we would fulfill the other command in Genesis, which is to fill and subdue the earth. And God's will is that a man and woman will practice and enjoy this part of their lives in that committed relationship as husband and wife. And we know what Satan does. Satan will take what God has created in God's plan and he will twist it and he will distort it. And he has deceived mankind into believing that instead of worshiping God, we should worship ourselves and and our, our appetites And so Satan has filled mankind with sinful alternative ways to satisfy this good desire that God has given to us outside of God's plan for us and therefore outside of God's will. So Paul is writing to these Thessalonians and Paul's desire is first and foremost for them to know the truth and to know God's will and standard and to pursue God's way over man's way. So what we're going to do as we get into the body of this message We're going to, um, Paul gives us this teaching in in 1 Thessalonians 4, and we're going to ask two questions, okay? And then Paul answers the questions through these verses. The two questions are, how can a believer be sexually pure? Second question is, why should a believer be sexually pure? And so now we turn to Paul's writing to answer those questions. It's kind of like Jeopardy. He gives us the answer. We have to come up with the questions. But the first question is this. How can a believer be sexually pure? We'll read verses 4 through the first part of 6. This is, this is how we can be pure sexually. That each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passions of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one transgress and wrong his brother in this matter. So in these couple verses here, we see at least two timeless principles on sexual purity. And the first one is this, okay? The body should not control the believer, okay? The body, our body, should not control the believer. And we all know, because we all have a body, we know how, know how easy it is to give into our cravings. Whether, whether they're sinful or not, we understand this. In fact, I'm going to use food as a, as a really safe example in a couple of these illustrations. But you know that when you're hungry in the house, your, your stomach growls, and there's, there's just foods that just call out to you. And you can hear them. They're calling your name. 
And, and so you go in the fridge, you go in the pantry. So we, we know how we just, okay, my body wants food. I'm just going to go find food, okay? Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and we are taught your body is not the master. The renewed mind is the master. So 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 13, Paul is writing to the, the Corinthians, and he starts off with a, a phrase or a proverb that is very common that they used to say to each other, which was this. Food is meant for the stomach and the stomach for food. So basically, if there's something in front of you and if it looks good, eat it because that's why you have a stomach. And, the stomach, and we make food to fill our stomach. But then he says, Paul says, here's the truth about your body. And God will destroy both one and the other. Okay? Food in the stomach, those are temporary things. We need to be focused on the eternal things. Second half is verse 13 up there on the screen. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. And so the Corinthians take, took this proverb that seemed to have a little bit of wisdom. Food is meant for the stomach and stomach for food. And so they said, well, the body is meant for sex, so sex for the body. So just, just go ahead and do this. What Paul is telling us is a new way of thinking. And it takes the renewal of our mind, in, as it says in Romans 12, to understand God's way. Therefore, be renewed by transformed by the renewal of your mind. That way you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. And so this is the renewed mind tells us our minds are masters over our body. The body is not our master. And for believers, we use our body as a tool to serve and worship God. Think about this in terms of like a family unit. You got parents and you got kids. Who's in charge? Now, we, we make a joke of this because in some families, the kids are in charge, but the parents are in charge. They don't just let the kids run around and, and do whatever they want to do. And that's the same of our bodies. Our minds are in charge. Our bodies are not. We'll keep going here in 1 Corinthians 6 up to verse 14. It says, And God raised the Lord and will also raise up, us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? Never. Here he's referencing their worship of Aphrodite. Or do you not know that, the people, that he who is joined to a prostitute becomes one body with her? For as it is written, the two will become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. And then in the next verse, verse 18, I'll show you in just a second, Paul gives us a command when it comes to sexual temptation. Okay? There are some temptations where we are supposed to stand fast and don't give in. A great example is food, right? Sometimes we can be disciplined with food. There's a plate full of cookies on the table and you can say, I'm only going to eat one and you can actually be disciplined and only eat one. But with this temptation of sexual temptation, Paul doesn't tell us to stand strong. He says, get out of there, flee. This is a different type of temptation. Verse 18, flee from sexual immorality. Every other sin a person commits is outside the body, but the sexually immoral person sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. You have to ask the question, why does Paul tell us to flee? What is, what is the danger, the extra danger here? And I think it's, part of it is this. Sexual sin is not as people think. It's not a servant to please us. Sexual sin leads people into bondage. This is one of the most powerful and destructive sins there is. Sexual sin can become someone's master. They are slave to it. They identify themselves with that. And so we're told, your body's not in control, your mind is, and flee. If you're tempted by sexual temptation, flee, get out of there. We'll go to Romans chapter 6. It talks about what we are slaves to. Romans chapter 6, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, who were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. 
I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. So here we are told that we must learn to control our appetites and cravings, and we need to understand as we fight this, how we can fight the, the, the good battle here is our minds are in control, the renewed mind is, the body is not, okay? Second way under this first point, the second way that we can be sexually pure is, realize the, the, the believers are not supposed to act like unbelievers. We, have called, we are called to a new way of living. Go back to verse 4. Verse 4 and 5 from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I've underlined verse 5. That's the point of this. It says that each one of you should, you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of, of, of just, not in the passion of, of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And so the people in Thessalonica, they were just simply doing what their culture taught them to do. And today, the world is constantly telling us or suggesting to us, just seek pleasure. But God has saved us from this and made us holy, meaning we are set apart from the world. I'm going to go back to Romans chapter 1. Uh, there's a lot there in Romans chapter 1. And it teaches us how God treats the world as they run after their own pleasures. So Romans chapter 1, beginning in verse 18... It says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Do we see this today? Absolutely, absolutely we do. I'm going to skip ahead to verse 28 in Romans chapter 1. We're going to actually come back in the next point to some of these verses that I'm skipping. But verse 28 says, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, Foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. Though they know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. And so this definitely describes the world that we live in. So in our passage for today, Paul gives us these two principles that we need to keep in mind. Not only when it comes to our sexual purity and understand the application of this is for any, any sins of the flesh, but we need to remember the body's not in control, the mind is. The renewed mind is in control and that we should not act like the world. The world is not leading us into the will of God. Now let's look at the second point, which is why a believer should be sexually pure. And he answers this question in the second part of verse 4 through 8. It says, why should a believer be sexually pure? Because the Lord is an avenger in all of these things, as we told you beforehand and solemnly warned you. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. Therefore, who dis whoever disregards this disregards not man, but God, who gives his Holy Spirit to you. And there are two reasons in here why a believer should be sexually pure. One is negative, and one is positive. We'll deal with the negative one first. And the negative reason why a believer should be sexually pure is because of God's vengeance. God is a punisher of sin. And one way that God punishes this kind of sin, and really, we're talking about all the sins of the flesh, is through allowing the natural consequences of sin to take place in our life. And potentially, especially with this subject, there are several potential natural consequences. One is... When sexual immorality is going on and it's unrepentant, there's no remorse, relationships are damaged. Marriages are destroyed because of this. And not always, sometimes there can be grace and forgiveness and mercy and there can be restoration if there's sexual immorality in the marriage. But there's also loss of respect and honor among others. There can be physical illness with sexual immorality. There can be disease. 
And in Romans, it talks about some of these natural consequences. And we're going to go back to verse 24 in Romans, uh, Romans chapter 1. And in it says a number of times that God gave them up. Meaning he, he let them go. They were, they were wanting this, pursuing this. And so a natural consequence is God let them do it. So let's read this. Go back to verse 24 of Romans chapter 1. It says, Therefore God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. Verse 26. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. And so those that pursue sexual activity outside of God's plan, one man, one woman, in the context of marriage, there's, God will let them go. God will give them the due penalty of their sin. Another reason why we should be sexually pure is because if it happens within the context of a Christian community, there, there needs to be discipline. If it's ongoing and unrepentant, and if it's, if it's um, yeah, someone is not, not repenting of this. A good example of this is in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, so we'll go there. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, ongoing gross sexual immorality was happening in this church, and Paul writes about it. 1 Corinthians 5.1 it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans. For a man has his father's wife and you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? Let him who has done this be removed from among you. And so this thought was going through with the Corinthians saying, well, they're consenting, it's fine, it seems to be working for them, so let's just accept them and, and embrace, let them do what they're going to do. But Paul says, no, there needs to be discipline here. Verse 3. For though absent in the body, I'm present in spirit. And, if, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment on the one who did such a thing. When you are assembled in the name of the Lord Jesus, and my spirit is present with the power of the Lord Jesus, you are to deliver this man to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. So we read this. And I think if you've been in Christian community for a long time, we, we know these things, but it's also good to actually hear them said because the world is teaching us something different. But hearing from God's word this warning is a reminder. So that's the negative reason why a believer should be sexually pure because of discipline. Here's the positive reason, okay? This is why a believer should be sexually pure. And it's because of God's new purpose for us. God has an eternal purpose for us. And when we are sexually pure, we are pursuing God's eternal purpose for us. Here's the thing about being saved. When we're saved, we're not just saved from something, the penalty of our sins. We are saved to something. We are saved to worship and serve our living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is, this is the positive message I think all of us need to embrace Ephesians 2.10 says, if we're saved, this is it. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So in moments of temptation, remind yourself, this is not my purpose. This is not my purpose. My purpose is to honor and serve the Lord. And in Timothy, I, I love this passage, it's one of my favorite ones. It tells us what God does with us when we strive for sexual purity among also all the other sins of the flesh. Listen to what it says. 2 Timothy 2, 21 and 22, it says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy and useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So when we say no, when we flee sexual temptation, along with all the other sins of the flesh, we are making ourselves useful for our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And verse 22 says, and this is going to kind of lead us into our third point here. 
He says, so flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. And so with this last verse, fleeing youthly passions and pursuing righteousness, I'm going to get into our final point where I'm making a couple of what I, what I hope are helpful, practical subject, suggestions on anyone who is struggling with this in, this, in, your, in your life. As we read, um, the Bible is clearly calling us to abstain from sexual immorality. And for anyone who is really struggling, I think all of us, I mean, we're human beings, so all of us struggle from time to time, at least in our thoughts. But sometimes the struggle goes into action and it can even get, get into addiction. But um, for anyone who is struggling with this, and, and not just this, but any of the uh, other sins of the flesh, anger, gossip, things like that, one strategy that is helpful beyond stopping the sinful behavior is to replace the behavior with something good. And so here's the first suggestion. Have a plan. Have a plan. When you are tempted, and we all know that whether it's sexual immorality or something else, we're all going to be tempted, but have a plan in place beforehand that says, when this happens, this is what I'm going to do. I want to use food as an example again. When we're hungry, um, I don't know about you, but sometimes I'm hungry. Okay, it's time for a snack. It's not time for lunch, not for din- time for dinner. I'm just going to open the refrigerator and whatever is in there that looks good, I'm just going to do it. Or the, we got the pantry, you know, the cookies are calling out. Um, we, we, that's just kind of how we do this. But when it comes to planning out our meals, if we plan in advance what we're going to eat, then we can choose healthy, good, nutritious food that we're going to put into our bodies. And so even planning out your meals a week at a time, you shop to you know, have the food for your plan can put us on a, a path towards physical health or even exercise. Most of us, we really like to sit around and, and relax. Like, in fact, they, today is Father's Day, and dads might say, I just want to watch the game. I, you know, I just want to sit around and I want to relax. But we know what's good for us is to, to go for a walk, go to the gym, and we need to plan and to build into our routine to make sure that we're doing something good. And so for this subject, sexual morality, and again, others do apply here, have a plan of how you're going to respond when tempted in this way, knowing you're going to, we're going to be tempted. We still live in these fleshly bodies. And, and let me, here's just a, a couple examples. Read your Bible. And if you think, of course, you're going to say that you're a pastor and this is church. But if you're tempted in a certain way and you say, I'm going to stop and I'm not going to follow through with that, I am going to now renew my mind by the transforming of God's word and I'm going to focus on what God says that is a powerful, powerful way to resist temptation. Um, another one is pray. Say, God, I'm weak right now. I, I, I need your help. Please help me. Another thing is, do what it says in 1 Corinthians 6.18. Get out of there. Whatever the situation is, get out of the situation and go do something that you have planned to do, a good work that God has prepared in advance for you when you're in that situation. And as always, it's very important, especially with our weaknesses and, and sexual temptation. If you have someone in your life that is holding you accountable, in those moments, call them, text them, say, hey, I'm weak right now, I need your help. Philippians 4 is kind of a game plan for not only how we should live our lives every day, but when tempted, this is what we are to do. We are to replace the temptation with something that we know is good. So Philippians 4, 8 says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. And so when tempted, say, and have this planned out in advance, this is what I'm going to think about, this is what I'm going to do when I'm in those moments. Have a plan knowing you will be tempted. And again, just I have Ephesians up here again. This is to remind us why we are saved. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So identify a handful of good works that you can focus on in any times of temptation. And the second suggestion is this. Okay, first is have a plan. But number two, tell someone. Tell someone. Anything that we struggle with in secret 
is very powerful in our lives and it can have mastery over us. But by bringing our sin out into the open and exposing it in this way, that's how we experience healing and forgiveness and restoration. James encourages us to do this, to be in relationships where we can do this. It says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. And so I encourage you, have a plan and have someone in your life that you can share this with, expose the sin. Sins that are done in secret are very powerful and damaging. So have a plan and expose your sin. Confess those sins to one another. As we conclude this passage and this message, I want to focus again on the good news that we see in here, okay? The good news is this. No matter where you're at in this room today or watching online, there is forgiveness. If you have stumbled or are stumbling in this area of sexual morality, there's forgiveness. When we truly repent, we realize what God's word is, the right thing to do, we go to him, there is forgiveness and also there is freedom. If you're deeply struggling with this, there is freedom, but you need to ask for help. One thing I've heard before, and I say this all the time, and I think this is so true, God is more concerned with where we are going than where we have been. That's why it's called grace. That's why it's called mercy. And so if these types of sin run deep in your life, ask for help. Ask for help. This is one of the reasons why God created the church, so we can help restore each other. So if you are here today, and this is something that is an issue in your life and you want help, uh, you can come talk to me, you can talk to Pastor Brent, you can talk to any one of our elders, and these situations will be held in confidence, okay? This is a place that you can come, you can share your burdens, and you can get help. And if anyone here is, is struggling, or even someone you know that is deeply struggling with these issues, I do want you to be aware of a couple of the people that we have in our congregation that are literally trained professionals to help people with some of the, the more complicated issues when it comes to sexual immorality. Um, Katie Beef Beavis, uh, she's Pastor Brent's wife. Um, she is a biblical counselor, although she's Mama, Mama Beavis now, so she's not actually practicing, but if you would like, where can I go, you could contact Katie Beavis. I have her phone number and her email in the, in the bulletin or in the sermon notes, so she can at least guide or direct you into a place. And the other person is Ed White. Ed White is right down here. No relation. Uh, we just have the same last name, brother from another mother. Although he's a lot older than me, so there's a big, big difference there. <laughs> I just, anyway, sorry. But Ed, Ed, um, Ed owns his own counseling practice. This is literally what he does. He is a, a professional counselor, and his focus primarily is on substance abuse, alcohol, and drugs, but he's also trained and able to help people with sexual addictions. Those two things go very hand in hand. So I just want you to be aware of Ed. This is his practice. This is what he does for a living. And if you contact him, um, whether you set up a time to meet with him or um, someone else, he can guide and direct you. Um, I also, I have some business cards. Ed gave me some business cards. Some of his business cards are in the foyer. Um, before we pray and we end this message, um, I want all of us to see God's heart in this. He saved us. God saved us. He redeemed us so that not only will we live for him forever, but that we can enjoy the freedom of living in God's grace in this life and be a testimony to the world around us. Because that's the point of this message. There's freedom, there's forgiveness, but there's also the call on our life to be sanctified, to avoid sexual immorality. So I hope that we will all take these warnings and encouragement as what they are. These are the words of God. And this is God's will for our life. So let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I thank you for this teaching. And this is definitely an area. And I don't want to just isolate and separate this from the other sins of the flesh because we struggle. All of us, every one of us struggles with something or multiple things. But thank you for your teaching on this and that we're able to discuss this in this setting. It's important for us to be reminded of your truth and our sexual purity and how important it is not only for our sake for our relationships but ultimately for our usefulness to you so we take these words to heart 
And Father, I pray that you will, as it says in Romans 12, that by reading this passage of scripture and focusing on this, that we will be transformed by the renewal of our mind, that we will be able to test and approve what your will is, your good, perfect, and pleasing will, and that we will see what is being taught and forced upon us out there in the world, and we'll, we will see it for what it is. It is a lie. It is a distortion. It is Satan's way to, to draw people away from your good, perfect plan and draw them away to destruction and sin and bondage. So thank you for today. Lord, I pray for anyone here that is truly struggling with this. May they know there is grace, there is forgiveness, there is help. And so help them have the courage to reach out to someone and that we can come alongside each other and help each other in our own sanctification as well. We pray these things humbly in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. We're going to close again with the benediction from 1 Thessalonians 5 because it's about sanctification. It says, And now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. All right, you are dismissed and have a wonderful Father's Day. Have a great week.